this video is going to go through some examples of using the method of power series in order to solve differential equations. We're going to use this for equations with variable coefficients because although this method works for constant coefficients, we know other methods that work better. For instance, undetermined coefficients works really well when we have constant coefficients. And before we go through some examples, let's go through the basic steps of how to use this method. First of all, we're going to assume our solutions are in a particular form. First of all, we're going to assume this is an analytical function that can be represented as a power series. That is, our solution y is going to equal the summation from k equals 0 to infinity of a coefficient a sub k times x to the k power. In order to use this method, just like when we did undetermined coefficients, we're going to find y prime and y double prime and plug it into our original differential equation. The next step is to collect powers of x and equate the coefficients to whatever's on the right hand side of the differential equation. If we have a homogeneous equation, then this step is very easy because we're going to set them all equal to zero. If this is a non-homogeneous differential equation, then we'll have to take the non-homogeneous part and find the power series representation of that series, and then we'll equate those coefficients. Step three will be to find the recurrence formula or relation to determine our a sub k's. The next thing we're going to do is find a sub k in terms of a0 and a1, which are our arbitrary constants. Before we were doing power series, we were usually using the constant c for our initial conditions. Again, I'm talking about, in this case, a second order differential equation, but of course we could expand this if this was a third or fourth order differential equation. But we'll keep things simple and talk about second order differential equations. So just like before, if we didn't have initial conditions, we would have two arbitrary constants for a second order differential equation. We will still have two arbitrary constants if we don't have our initial conditions. Again, now we're calling them a0 and a1 instead of c1 and c2. But they're the same arbitrary constants and they're the same number of them as we had before. And finally, we'll take those coefficients and plug them into our solution, y equals the summation of k equals 0 to infinity, a k, x to the k. I'll be referring to these steps throughout the examples, so you might want to take note of what the five steps are. Again, step one is we're going to assume a solution in this form. Once we have this y, we find y prime and y double prime and plug them back into our original differential equation. We're going to collect powers of x and equate them to the coefficients on the left hand side. Again, we did this with undetermined coefficients. It's the same type of process. But now, instead of actual numbers, we're going to get instead a recurrence formula or a recurrence relation. We're going to then be able to take that recurrence relation and find our general a k in terms of a zeros and a1s. And we'll take those coefficients and finally plug them back into our solution, which we had assumed at step one, our y equals the power series. Let's start with this equation, y double prime minus x times y prime plus 2y equals zero. This is a second order differential equation. It's homogeneous and it has non-constant coefficients because of this x. And I'm noting that I don't have initial conditions, so I'm expecting to have two arbitrary constants when I'm done with my solution. So step one is to assume the solution in the form y equals the summation from k equals zero to infinity, a k times x to the k. And when I do that, I find that y prime is equal to the summation from k equals one to infinity, of k a to the k x to the k minus 1. Notice that's why we bothered with Taylor polynomials back in Calc 2, because it's so much easier to find derivatives and integrals of simple polynomials. I also start at k equals 1 instead of k equals 0, because when I take the first derivative of a constant, which if I go back to my original solution, y equals k 0 to infinity a sub k x to the k, that first term will be x to the 0 power, when I take the derivative of something that's a constant, it's equal to zero. So zero plus anything is still that anything. So I'm just going to start my summation at k equals one. When I take my second derivative, it's the same thing, but now I'm going to go to k equals two. And again, this is our simple roll down rule for taking derivatives. Now what I'm going to do is plug it back into my differential equation. 
So wherever I see y double prime, I plug in the summation from k equals 2 to infinity, k times k minus 1 times a sub k, x to the k minus 2. Then I throw in the y prime. Again, I'm putting it into my original differential equation, so I'll have the negative x out front of the y prime, and then plus 2 times my y. And this is homogeneous, so it all equals 0. Now what we need to do is try to get our coefficients all to be the same in this equation. That is, I want everything to be x to the k, or x to the k minus 1, or x to the k minus 2. I want them to all be the same. This is all step two. The first thing I'm going to do is look at my middle term and pull that x to the first power into my summation. x to the first times x to the k minus 1 by using my exponent rules is simply x to the 1 plus k minus 1, or x to the k. And now my second two terms both have x to the k. So I'm going to look at my first term and see if I can make that be x to the k instead of x to the k minus 2. What I'm going to do first is try to change that summation. Instead of starting at k equals 2, I'm going to see what happens if I make that starting at k equals 0. When I do that, I get this equation. I always double check myself if in the first equation I wanted a k at the be to be my first term and k started at 2, then it means my first term must be a sub 2. So when I re-index my k and start at 0, I want to again make sure my first term is a sub 2. So in order for that to happen, I take the k, which is 0, and add 2 to it. So I know that anywhere I see a k, I'm going to replace it with a k plus 2. So now all of my x's have the same exponent. They're all x to the k. So I could go ahead and pull that out. Well, I can't quite because I also need the indices of my summation to be the same. So it looks like if I go towards k equals 1, I'll be able to pull out a summation starting at k equals 1. In order for that to happen, I'm going to take my first term and my third term, and I'm going to pull out that first term of k equals 0. So let's look at the first term. If I pull out my k equals 0, then I get 0 plus 2 times 0 plus 1 times a sub 0 plus 2 x to the 0, and then I have the rest of my summation now starting at k equals 1. So that's perfect. I'm going to do the same thing to my third term. My second term already starts at k equals 1, so I don't have to do anything to that. So in this case, the k equals 0 term is equal to a sub 0 x to the 0. And we also have that 2 outside the summation, so I'm going to have 2a0 x to the 0 plus 2 times the rest of the summation. But now we're starting at k equals 1. And cleaning this up a little bit more, I get this. So I know this is a homogeneous equation, everything has to equal 0, so that means my x to the 0 coefficients are this. And my x to the k beyond 0 is simply this. Well, maybe that's not that simple. But it says all the other coefficients in front of x to the k also have to be 0, because again, on the left-hand side, x to the 0 has a coefficient of 0, x to the first has a coefficient of 0, etc. This is just like what we did in undetermined coefficient. I do want to point out I did something a little funny with pulling out the a k. I pulled out a negative a k, so that way instead of negative k plus 2, it's negative a k times k minus 2. So I just pulled out a negative sign in addition to the a k. Step 3 is to find a recursive relation. I know that 0 equals 2 a 2 plus 2 a 0, or that means that a 2 is simply equal to negative a 0. Again, what our goal is to, is to get everything in terms of a 0 or a 1. So I'm now going to deal with my second equation, and this is why I pulled out the negative a k instead of just a positive a k, because I know I'm going to want to put it on the other side of the equal sign. And that is my recurrence relation. We come up with what my next a k is based on a previous value for a k. So now step four is to find a sub k in terms of a0 and a1. So I start with my a0 and I start with my a1. I already know that a2 is simply equal to negative a0. 
So now I'm going to find A3. And when I'm trying to find A3, remember in this case, if I want 3 and I was talking about k plus 2, that means k is equal to 1. So I'm going to use my recurrence relation and then anywhere I see a k, I'm going to plug in 1. And doing that, I get negative 1 6 a sub 1. And we keep going. To find a sub 4, I keep in mind that means that k is going to be equal to 2. And it looks like that's just going to be equal to 0 because 2 minus 2 is 0. And now I'll go on for a sub 5 when k is equal to 3. So a sub 5 is equal to 8 sub 3 divided by 20. Well, I know what a sub 3 is. It's negative 1 6 a 1. So a sub 5 is equal to negative 1 over 120 a 1. And I find a 6 is equal to 2 times a 4 divided by, well, it doesn't really matter because a 4 is equal to 0. All the even terms after a sub 2 will be equal to 0. Let's do one more. Let's do a sub 7. a sub 7 is simply 3 over 42 times a sub 5. I know what a sub 5 is, so if I plug that all in and simplify my fractions, I get negative 1 over 1680 times a 1. And again, a sub 8 would be equal to 0. So let's do our final step, which is to put these all back together into our original y. So we never go back to all of this because we did all of this just to find out what our a sub k's are. Once we have our a sub k's, we go back to our original solution, and now we're simply plugging in the values for a sub k. So a sub 0 plus a sub 1 x to the first plus a 2 x squared plus a sub 3 x to the third, etc and plugging in the values we know, and we'll end up with this. And if I want to combine all my a zeros and all my a ones, I can even think of this as two separate y's. And if I like to split it up like that, I can think of my general y then as being a zero times y one plus a one times y two. This matches how we've done things in the past where all the c ones were together and all the c twos were together. So it might not look like a pretty solution, but it is in fact a solution using series. This would be something very easy for a computer to calculate, even if it doesn't look pretty. Let's practice with another one. y double prime plus y equals zero. Now, this is not one that really we'd ever want to do with a series solution. And well, let's solve it the old fashioned way with the characteristic equation. I would find r squared plus one equals zero, which when I solve for r, I would get plus or minus i, and that would be my complex solutions. So I know this is what I would get for a pure imaginary solution to my characteristic equation. And e to the zero, of course, is just equal to one. So I'm gonna go through a lot more work to come up with that same solution, but it's nice to be able to practice new techniques against something that you know from other methods. I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did the previous example. I'm going to assume a certain y, find the y prime and the y double prime. Now I'm going to plug that back into my original differential equation. In this case, I only need the in this case I only need y double prime and y. And the first thing I'm going to do with this to start step two is to change the index of the first term to start at k equals zero, using the same trick to make sure it should be k replaced with k plus 2. The first equation I had started at k equals 2. My first term was a sub 2. In this case, I've got starting at k equals 0. And if I want that first term to still have an a of 2, then I need to make sure that I add 2 to my k. And the second term stays the same. So I already have my indices the same and my x is raised to the same power. So since I have my summation starting at the same k value and I have my x raised to the k power in both terms, I can, I can combine this into 1. So all these coefficients have to be equal to 0. So that means what's in the bracket has to be equal to 0. So I can write the recursion relation as a k plus 2 equals negative a k over k plus 2 times k plus 1. And that's step three. 
So now we want to go on to step four to find a k in terms of a zero and a one. And we'll start off with knowing that a zero and a one are our arbitrary constants. So a two is equal to negative a zero divided by two. When k equals one, we're looking at a sub three, and that's equal to negative a one divided by three times two. I can continue this for a four and a five. And when I do that, if I go back and find out what a2 was and a3 was, I start seeing a pattern. And I can write this all in terms of factorials. So if I take that and put it back into my general solution, I'll get this expansion. And this is what I'll get when I plug everything in. And if I split this up into my a0 terms and my a1 terms, this is what I'd get for a0 times y1 and a1 times y2. And since we kind of sort of already know our solutions are sine and cosine, I can go back and remember what the power expansion series is for sine and cosine. Since this was our sine and cosine, it's looking remarkably that y1 just might be equal to the power expansion of cosine, and y2 just might be the power expansion of sine. Remember the 2n guarantees that being an even number, and the 2n minus 1 guarantees it being an odd number, which matches my exponents for y1 and y2, which means a0 times cosine x is a0 times y1, and a1 times y2 is a1 times sine x. So that means y is equal to a0 cosine x plus a1 times sine x. We could go ahead and make a0 c1 and a1 c2 if we want to make it exactly match what we had with the other method. But of course, a constant is just a constant. I want to look at one more example. If I go back to our previous example, these Taylor series expansions are actually Maclaurin series. That is, these are all around x equal to 0. If I take this differential equation, the first thing we need to do is divide everything by x squared to get it in standard form. Well, if we're looking at the point around x equals 0, well, we're going to run into trouble because, look, I'm dividing by 0, and that's generally not a good thing. The previous examples, I'm going to go back and say that the point I was trying to get around, the point x equals 0, is called an ordinary point. That is, it doesn't cause any problems like dividing by 0. My second equation well, x can be equal to anything because it's not even in the equation. If you remember, that's called an autonomous differential equation. So x equals 0 is certainly still an ordinary point. But in this case, when x equals 0, we have problems. So this is called a singular point. I'm going to stick with just talking about ordinary points. But just so you know, if you're dealing with a singular point, you need to take extra precaution when solving it. You can't just use the steps I've used. 